Today is an exciting day. You know, I've, I've noticed over the years that sometimes the communion service is not a service that everybody jumps up and comes to. And I think that's because we don't always get the vision for what it can be. And so today I want us to experience it in a little different way and, and get that vision. But before we go there, we have among us somebody who's very special to this church family, Kim Christensen. She's here. Yay. Yeah. <clears throat> and Kim is undertaking a task to be able to share God's love with another part of the world, and she would like to tell you about it. We thought we would have you hear about it so that maybe you would like to help her in this endeavor. So, Kim, come on up and tell us what's going on. Is it on? Oh, okay, it's on. All right, so good morning. It's great to be here this weekend and see everybody and see all the familiar faces again. Um, I came down this weekend because I have an opportunity that I'd like to share with you guys that's been laid in front of me, and I strongly believe that God wants me to take hold of it right now. Um, as some of you know, I've been going to school up at Western, up in Bellingham, and I'm getting my degree in linguistics and a minor in TESOL so I can teach English as a second language, because that is the passion God has put in my life at this moment, and I want to further that. I want to find out what he wants me to do with that. Um, and at Western, I have been involved with a campus Christian fellowship. It's called CCF on campus there. And they're the best group of Christian um, college people <laughs> I've ever met. I mean, this is a great community. And I don't think my experience on Western would have been the same had I not met them. Um, it's there at the um, one of the evening sermons on campus that they had a guest speaker a long-term missionary from China come and speak to us about opportunities in China to reach out to people in more rural communities who need Christ and who also need a helping hand in life. Um, so what they're doing, one of the projects, is to teach ESL in a rural community, and this will help elevate their standard of living. This will help them get better jobs and to just help each other and, and their families um, in this way. So I was given that opportunity and I was like, wow, that's exactly what I want to do after I graduate. And to do it with a, um, such a loving church community and to just be surrounded by Christians as I'm going to do this, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my time. And I'm really excited about it. So as of right now, I am scheduled to go on this missions trip um, this summer um, and I can't wait. Um, the only trick is, is that I need help desperately. <laughs> and I'm halfway there, but I need to go the other half, and then I can go. Um, so if you'd like to help me out in any way that you can, or if you can't help me out, then prayers are much needed for all of our safety over there, because there's many of us that are going from different parts of Washington. Um, there's many of us that are going to be going over there to help the long-term missionaries with their project to help these people in the community over there. So prayers are much needed. So um, pray, pray, pray that we'll be safe, we'll be healthy, and that we'll come back home. I can't wait to learn so much from the community there, from the people that live there, and to learn so much from the long-term missionaries as well as to how they work and what they're passionate about and how I can help people better there in the community. So I'll be here after the sermon. So if you want to come up and talk to me more about it, I can give you more details. I can't give too many details because it's being recorded and it's kind of a, just a little bit of a risk to the people that are going if I give too many details. So um, come talk to me about it. Um, I'd love to share with you about it. Um, I'm really excited and there's different ways you can help me out with this and I can give you that information afterwards and it's also in the pamphlet my contact information if you'd like to contact me that way so thank you so much I'll talk to you later thank you Kim let's pray father in heaven I want to pray that you will bless Kim in her mission that's exciting Exciting that we can uh, 
have some part in sending her to touch people in another part of the world where the gospel has had a challenge to spread. Lord, as we turn our attention now to, to something of your word and to reflecting on the meaning of what we're doing here together today, I pray for your spirit to fill me, but even, even more than that, that your spirit will fill every person here. Speak to us individually. Thank you in Jesus' name. So today I want to share with you the doctrine of food, or at least something about it. Tell me, just yell it out, what is your favorite restaurant? Indian food, all right, good. Now, let me ask you another question to follow up on that. What restaurant do you most often go to? All right. Now, most likely, and maybe I'm just an anomaly, I think I'm probably not, I have my favorite restaurants, and then I have the restaurants I actually go to more often. And the reason that I go to the other ones more often is because they are fast food restaurants. All right. Yeah. So there's this, there's this vision of what food can be, and then there's the reality of what it usually is. I mean, there's that rush, that rush. Why do we rush? You know, imagine uh, if you've ever had a picnic with a bunch of kids and you're getting lunch ready and, and lunch is a little bit late. What happens when you say, it's ready, lunch is ready? They would swarm in like a pack of wolves on this table and everything would be going this way and that way. You know, it's possible that you've got the kids more corralled than that. But usually when you get them together, they're in a pack mentality and, you know, it's just, there it is. Wow, that happened. You know, we rush through one of the great joys of life, food, because we just have to get by. And so I've often found myself making one of my favorite rush foods. It's one that I developed the art of in college, and that is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's actually peanut butter and jam. We were down at Southern Adventist University, my brother and I, that's down in Tennessee, and we would go to the store, I think it was Winn-Dixie, Anyone know Winn-Dixie? All right. And we would uh, <clears throat> go to Winn-Dixie, and we'd find there a, uh, two things. Peanut butter. I have to apologize for the peanut butter that I have here. I wasn't the one that purchased. This is creamy peanut butter, which means that I'm not always living up to the standards that I set for myself. <laughs> anyway, we get peanut butter, the appropriate kind back then before I was married and things changed. And um, <laughs> love you, Laura. And we'd also get, along with that, <clears throat> where is it? Oh, yes. Bama brand. Does anyone know Bama brand jam? All right, maybe not. Bama brand, okay, yes. Strawberry jam. It always had to be strawberry. Now, today... To kind of offset the fact that I use creamy peanut butter, I do have homemade strawberry jam. Ooh. My wife took some beautifully plump, ripe strawberries and squished them all up and mixed in some other things, and boy, it's really good stuff, really good stuff. I can see the, well, maybe. I can see the, um, you know, the, the textures in there. It's got just the right amount of chunky, and it's also perfect, really perfect stuff. And anyway, back then when we used to have peanut butter and jelly a lot, it was partly a rush thing, rushing off to soccer practice, rushing off to a class, and so we would just make peanut butter and jelly, and it was, you know, pretty good rush food, actually, as far as things go. And uh, I find myself more and more, if I'm at home by myself, which is rare, but if I am, that's what I reach for often. If I'm just in for lunch and out to something else, it's this rush food. Anyone else? Does this appeal to you? Would like peanut butter and strawberry? Okay, come on up. Come on up. <clears throat> come on up, Michael. Here you go. Excellent. It might drip on you, so you won't want one of these. Here's the only thing I'm going to make you do, or ask you to do. You know, I'm not going to make you do anything. I'm going to ask you to find somebody else to give the other half to. Okay. Can you do that? Yes. All right. And there's a reason for that. It's another plate. Good. Good. <laughs> all right we've made a connection beautiful 
You know, the theme of what I wanted to share with you as we begin communion today is this concept of somebody else. So Michael has just found somebody else to share the, the joy of that sandwich with. This is in contrast to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's writing about food. Again, this is the doctrine of food. And he's writing about food, and he's saying, you guys are doing food wrong. Here's what he says. It describes very much that you know, swarm of kids at the picnic. It says, but in the following instruction, I do not commend you because you come together. When you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Oh, you guys should have just stayed home. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. Well, I'm glad that's kind of outmoded. That doesn't happen in churches anymore, right? That's good. That's good. And, and I believe it in part, he says. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, for in eating each one goes ahead with his own meal. Ah, oh, Michael's done a better thing here. Each one goes ahead with his own meal, and one goes hungry. Another gets drunk. Ooh. That's not good. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who are, have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not, Paul writes. So obviously, Paul is not very happy with the way that they're doing food, and his basic contention is that they are not concerned about other people. And so as we come together in the Lord's Supper, as we celebrate that today, I would think that maybe we should take a lesson Actually, not maybe. We should take a lesson from Paul and we say, how can we make this about somebody else? You know, as I've experienced the Lord's Supper over time, I, I have noticed that we tend to look at it as almost a ritual by which we receive something from God. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It's a sacred ritual, the symbol of the bread and the juice, and I take it and it's about me and God, and that's true. But Paul would seem to suggest it's about more than that. It's about somebody else. It's not just about me receiving the grace from God. It's about me extending that grace to someone else, maybe? It's interesting to look at the history of, of food in the Old Testament, especially. It seemed like whenever God wanted the people to celebrate something, he would, uh, he would create a feast. A feast. Now, how is everything in your religious life about food? Well, apparently to God, it seemed like it was. Fascinating to me. And there was a custom related to food in the ancient Near East that I think God was building on when he would make feasts for every major religious um, celebration. You see, in the ancient Near East, food was something that was very much, very much about other people. If Keith here were to come to my house one morning, and he was on a journey, and I knew this, I would invite Keith in, and I would make him comfortable there, and I would begin to elaborately prepare food. Yeah, I would. I'll give you my address later. You can come on up. I have to check my Google Calendar first, though. And, and, and so you'd send a servant or a kid or whoever got the job out I would probably send them out to catch the goat. It'd be part of the, the, the job. You know, remember, we started in the morning. I'd send them out to catch the goat. By the way, I'm using mayonnaise here. I'm, share, I'm sparing you from the heresy of, of Miracle Whip, so you can thank me for that. <laughs> some of you might not have heard me clearly or something. I don't know. There was some objection around there. Yeah. All right, man. Okay, good, good. And so he'd send somebody out to catch the goat, and then some, that person would probably be stuck with milking the goat and, and, and collect that, that, that good beverage. And then someone else would be sent out to the other pasture to find the calf. And the calf would be caught, and the calf would be killed. It would be dressed and slow roasted over some, some wood fire. That would be good. And, uh, of course, if you're vegetarian, maybe that doesn't strike you so excitingly, but it's okay. It's okay. Stripples, yeah, we found some veggie meat there. And so there would be a careful preparation of, of the meat. I don't have the meat here. 
but maybe the cheese. Let's say that's equivalent to the meat. And, and there would be a careful preparation, and, and there would be a lot of work and a lot of expense put into simply providing a meal for Keith just because he came over. Because food was very much about valuing somebody else. And so when God was uh, leading his people out of Egypt, and the great exodus was about to occur, then God instituted a feast, a feast. And when he instituted that feast, he made a very specific instruction. Go out and kill a lamb and take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost to indicate that this home is protected by that blood. And, and then take that meat from that lamb and eat it together. Share it with one another. He said if it's too big a lamb or the family's too small, then you find a neighboring home and you share with them. But the point was that you share it with somebody else. Share it with somebody else. And uh, And then later on, when Jesus was sitting with his disciples and having that same Passover celebration with them, He told them to take the cup and share it among themselves. He told them to take the bread and share it among themselves. It's interesting to me. I don't want to make too much out of little hints here and there, but I think collectively they all point to what Paul was trying to say there in 1 Corinthians 11 when he said this is about, about somebody else. It's not my best work. <clears throat> it's a little messy here. But, you know, one of the things that if you're going to take an, a little more time and make a nicer sandwich, one of the things that you ought to do is put Parmesan cheese on it. Yeah. Just a little bit. <clears throat> and if you choose to do pepper, well, that's okay, but not if it's pre-ground pepper. you got to fresh grind that. Here you go. That's pretty good. And then you can enjoy your sandwich. When was the last time that you took time to enjoy a good vegetable sandwich? Recently? Has it been a while? I mean, besides what you got at Subway. That doesn't count. Or Jimmy John's. I mean, no, nothing against those fine establishments, but... Right? Would anyone like to enjoy one now? You're not sure about the pepper? There you go, David. Good. Same rule applies. Find somebody else. Might be a good idea if it was your wife. Find somebody else to share the other half with. Somebody else. Enjoy. Enjoy. But you know, as it regards food, there's the peanut butter and jelly or the Taco Bell, which just gets me through the experience. And, and it's good enough, and it's okay. And there's, there's that Sunday afternoon meal where we have an opportunity to make a, maybe a nice veggie sandwich in a little bit more time. Now, oftentimes, Laura will cook me these fancy meals at home, and I'll come home for lunch, and so that, that's just a whole other category, and I'm really excited about it. But as far as my ability to engage with food personally, it's only on those rare maybe Sunday afternoons where I get to make something nicer. But then there are those late night times when I should be going to bed, and instead I'm going to the fridge. Anyone know that time? And that's when I really, really start to enjoy food. I usually pull out one of these. Okay. Yeah? And into that, I start to put things that I can't put into the food when my kids are eating, like jalapeno peppers. Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. That's really good stuff. Maybe I'll dice those up for you a little bit. Does anyone like jalapenos? Okay, these aren't super hot, but they're, they're good. And these are canned jalapenos, because, of course, canned jalapenos and fresh jalapenos, those are two different things, two very different things. And I'll probably put in a little bit of uh, protein. This looks like hamburger. Don't be fooled. It's actually a vegetarian uh, protein, but it's okay. You'll be all right. A and then... Maybe I'll put some, you know, as I put a little bit more 
uh, energy into this, I pull out the olives. Now, I always know that my wife bought the olives for some specific purpose, so I have to do this late at night when she doesn't see me do it. <laughs> These olives are kind of at a premium. But I'm going to take and put some of those olives in there for you. Because, you see, the point of all of this is to realize that God intended for us to enjoy... Okay, obviously, I don't know how to use the can opener. God intended for us to enjoy food, and that's why he made a feast around each of these religious observances. And that's why, and specifically that social aspect of it, that's why, okay, I'm not sure what I'm saying because I'm too busy making this here. So what was I saying, right? So he put food around the religious pro, uh, celebrations because food meant something in the ancient Near East. It was about serving somebody else. And so <clears throat> when you can take a little more time to enjoy the gift more fully, that's when you have the opportunity to really reflect on the joy that God put into this food gift, right? I mean, what's, what's like your most favorite meal, um, Kathy? Pick on you. Yeah. Not sure? Okay. What's your favorite meal, Dan? Okay. Good old haystack. Nice. That was a good call. All right. Fried chick? Lasagna. Nice. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. You've got to be corn chips for haystacks. You're right, Dan. Those other variations are just, they're essentially heresy. They're a departure from the way. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I'm going to ignore that comment about string cheese, okay? I didn't hear that. It's hard to hear up here. Let's see who said that. Yeah, okay. And uh, also late at night, if I'm cooking this for myself, I know one thing that just sets off the flavors in that nice wrap is onion powder. And since my wife's already in bed, that's okay. The bad breath thing is okay. And then you've got to put some uh, black pepper on that. I know black pepper is probably an irritant to my system, but I'm going to ignore that. Because it smells really, really good. The garlic. the garlic. I actually brought the garlic right here, but it's going to take me too long to cook, cut it up. So fresh garlic, fresh onion, that's something else I can't put in there when my, when my kids are eating. <clears throat> and here is... It's not perfect. It's not everything, but it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. Who would like to try it out? Anybody? Well, I see hands all over. I just can't figure out who to choose. Who's that? Aaron. All right. And I need you to take it and then find somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody else. <clears throat> You know, I, I read a story about Mr. T. You know Mr. T? I mean, what's like the most favorite Mr. T saying? I pity, I pity the fool. Yeah, there we go. Nice. You all know. And Mr. T is uh, known for a few uh, physical attributes besides his big muscles. He was actually a professional wrestler for a while. Before that, I think he was a Navy SEAL. Um, he was a private security guy. He did a lot of crazy things. He was also an actor on... What is it? Uh, 1976, a crack commando unit was sent to prison. You know that one, right? The A-Team. I pity the fool. Well, Mr. T has, uh, is still alive. I didn't actually know that. I hadn't heard from him for a while. Uh, but Mr. T is also known for his mohawk, right? And what else? Gold chains. Gold chains. 
Well, when Hurricane Katrina came along, Mr. T went to help the folks down there who were suffering with that. And he said that after that experience, he just couldn't wear his gold chains anymore. Because he realized that he was enjoying this, this richness when others were lacking. And so he made a shift in his life because he recognized the need in somebody else. And that signature piece of Mr. T's wardrobe just went away. It's the regard for somebody else. Somebody else. And so as Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper, he talks about that somebody else. He comes down hard on them and says, this is not the Lord's Supper you're eating because somebody's eating too much and somebody goes hungry and somebody gets drunk and, and you're all grabbing stuff instead of thinking of somebody else. But he says, here's how it should be. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm giving my body for somebody else. I'm giving my blood for somebody else. I want you to remember that. I want you to do the same. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And it was on that same night that Paul is reflecting on there in which Jesus, who was the master of them all, did something extraordinary. He looked around the table, and you know the story, you probably know the story. He looked around the table and he saw that none of his disciples who were currently busy jockeying for the highest spot in his coming kingdom, which they conceived to be an earthly kingdom, mistakenly, none of them were going to do the task that nobody wanted to do. None of them was going to play the role of the servant and to come and wash everyone's feet. And so Jesus got up, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and played the role of the ser servant. And he said, you know what I've done, right? I, your master and Lord, have done this for you. You also ought to wash each other's feet, serve one another. And I think, honestly, if you think about it, it wasn't so much about the act of washing the feet. It was about that somebody else, extending grace to somebody else. And so as we proceed with this reenactment, it's not a dramatic reenactment, but we are the participants in reenacting the Lord's Supper. It's fitting that we begin with that today. And so you are invited, if you want to stay in here and reflect on these things, you can, but you are invited to make your way out of the worship center momentarily and go down the hallway back this direction, and there's some basins and some towels, and you are invited to find somebody else to whom you can extend God's grace today. And serve them by washing their feet. And after that, we'll come back in here and we'll take part in the bread and the, the juice and we'll reflect on that as well. And there's something special we're going to do with that one too. Because this is all about taking the joy of God represented by the food. The great, one of the great pleasures of life. Taking time to enjoy that, but more significantly, taking time to give that joy to someone else. To extend the grace of God to someone else. And so I want to pray with you, and then we'll let you go and wash someone's feet, if you can find that somebody else, and we'll join back in here. But let's pray as we seek that person. Father in heaven, it's a blessing, it's an honor to be part of what you're doing in somebody else's life. Whoever that somebody else is this morning that you're inviting each of us to go serve, I pray that you'll put that name in our minds now. Or help us to know it when we see them as we stand up and walk down the hall. Help us to find that person for whom we can extend your grace so that they may be blessed too today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go. And uh, come back when you're done. It was not we're back. I hope you had a meaningful moment with someone or had a chance to reflect here.
we're almost done today, but I think what we're about to do is maybe the most important part. It's customary as we reenact or celebrate the Lord's Supper for us to, again, take that bread and remember what Jesus said about it. This is my body, which is broken for you, signaling his sacrifice. And it's also customary for us to take the juice as a separate symbol of his, uh, the cleansing aspect of his blood on our lives, that he can cleanse us from sin, and to also take that for ourselves. But today, I think, as we reflect on this idea that this is about extending grace to somebody else, would it be all that weird for us to take those symbols, receive them from the deacons as they come through, and then get up and take them to somebody else? Would that be okay? I want us to do that now. Um, the deacons, I think, are ready to distribute the bread and wine, or bread and juice. It's juice, by the way. So we can avoid the scenario in 1 Corinthians 11 where if somebody's getting drunk, we've taken care of that. <laughs> we've also given you real small pieces, you know, so it's good. But again, I want you to, that's, that's the basic idea here. We'll, we'll just share that. We'll take the symbol. We'll go find somebody else that you want to either, you want to extend grace to them in some way, for some reason. Maybe it's because you know that you've been a <laughs> unkind to them, and it's time for you to switch. It might be that you just know they've been going through a struggle in their life, and they just need to know that somebody else thought of them, so you can take it to them. It might be just that you look across the worship center and you see somebody that you care about for whatever reason, and you just want them to know that. But in some way, I invite you, you know, just a moment to take that symbol, take it in hand, and walk it over to somebody else. So let's pray together. Let's receive the symbols. And as soon as you receive them, you can get up and find somebody else. Let's pray. God in heaven, there are so many ways in which we fall short of what you want for us. As we take the symbols of your sacrifice, we confess our sins, yes. But another way in which you have so much more for us is the way in which we express your love to others. Lord, today as we do this simple thing, teach us about that, I pray. Bless the symbol of the bread. Bless the symbol of the juice. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.